Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by grants from the Georgia Natural Resources Foundation, the Emlay Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, and from viewers like you. Georgia has clusters of barrier islands that make up its coastline. You can drive to a few, but most islands hold their secret charms a boat ride away. The heavens shatter with an explosion of wings. Birds surf the waves in an undisturbed paradise. And the sunsets, ah, the spectacular sunsets. It is different here. Colors more rich. Textures like paint on a canvas. Salt marsh grass softens the borders of Georgia's barrier islands. The creeks running through the marshes create canals that look like some ancient maze. Isles that surround this state are like glimmering jewels dropped around the neck of the mainland to create a coast unconnected and unique. The Georgia coast, due to the, the, the shoreline being so inland, uh, is, is away from the Gulf Stream offshore. The Gulf Stream's about 80 miles to the east of the Georgia coast, and so that has resulted in a great diversity of tides. We have a tidal swing of, uh, depending on the moon phase, of, of six to eight, sometimes up to 10 feet. Georgia's coast is only 100 miles long if you draw a straight line. But the nooks and crannies of each island make the true length closer to 800 miles. At 36,000 acres, Cumberland is one of the largest undeveloped islands on the eastern seaboard. Protected by the Park Service, the national seashore is isolated with only 300 people allowed to visit on any given day. The wildlife is incredible. Turkeys strut. The occasional bobcat quickly darts away. More than 500 plant species adorn the land. And during the right season, you may spot a loggerhead turtle laying her eggs under a full moon. But this is what many visitors come to see. Wild horses freely roam the island Some say Spanish inhabitants left them. Others consider them a nuisance, abandoned by former landowners. Regardless, they lend an additional sense of wildness to this place. And without any assistance, they have managed to survive the often harsh elements. Cumberland was once home to Pittsburgh steel baron Thomas Carnegie. The grand Carnegie mansion, called Dungeness, is now in ruins. 
a haunting reminder of all who lived here before. Like most Georgia islands, Cumberland was viewed as a golden isle. And the Carnegie family was not the first to recognize the reason for that term. The islands were referred to as golden in some of the reports that went back to Europe, to Spain, and even to England. And they were referred to as golden because of the beauty and the uh, accessibility and the fact that they were thought to be quite fertile for agriculture. Just above Cumberland lies Jekyll Island, once owned by an exclusive club that catered to millionaires. The land was purchased for a mere $125,000. Then the Jekyll Island Club was developed by wealthy northern businessmen. Names like Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, and Morgan. The Sea Islands were famed for their tender beauty in the late 1800s when millionaires from the north became, during the Industrial Age, the, the robber barons, the age of the robber barons and the great industrialists. Um, they had so much money, and they simply came down and bought these islands. Today, the island is a popular tourist getaway. A causeway leads to Jekyll with beautiful salt marshes at every turn. Visitors enjoy a laid-back atmosphere here, where they can choose from a wide variety of activities. Like all barrier islands, Jekyll is constantly losing sand from one section and gaining it in another. In a spot called Boneyard, the erosion creates these sculptures with a romantic beauty of their own. Just a short distance away by water, the St. Simon's Lighthouse beckons. Built in 1872, it still serves as a navigation aid for traffic entering St. Simon's Sound. It is the center of a little village and a hub for tourists taking in the island charm. At one time, the only way you could get to St. Simon's Island was by boat. Once a bridge was built, the St. Simon's population exploded. This has become a vibrant community of homeowners, retirees, and tourists. Fort Frederica is at the north end. It was built by the English to protect Darien and Savannah from Spanish invaders. The beauty of this island belies a bloody skirmish when the English held off Spanish forces in 1742. Now, the region is better known for peaceful kayaking excursions, among the thousand acres of marshland. Georgia's coast has an estimated one-third of all salt marsh on the entire east coast. That marsh supports many species year-round. It also serves as an important stopping point for migratory birds. With so many species in Georgia, scientists have come to recognize this coast as a yeah. research haven. I think we're good. Biologists have been able to track their incredible journeys by trapping and tagging the birds as they pass through. Salt marsh sparrows are fitted with tiny backpacks that carry a radio signal. That signal will allow scientists to better understand where the birds are going and why their population is steadily declining. 
So these are these are tiny little tiny little birds weighing several grams, and yet they're migrating up to at least Maine. Some of them into Canada. Um, and so it's a really amazing feat for a, a bird that weighs as much as nine or ten pennies. Several of the species that I work with depend entirely on salt marshes. Uh, so, for example, whimbrel, a migratory shorebird that nests in the high Arctic and winters in in South America comes through our coastline for about six weeks every spring and feeds on fiddler crabs in our marshes. Uh, and that's, that's the critical staging area for them to put on the weight they need to then fly to the Arctic to, to nest. One of the best places to see birds is nearby Little St. Simons Island. It is privately owned and set up as a nature resort. This island is opposite the hustle and bustle of St. Simon's. A boat brings you here where 11,000 acres of pristine maritime forests and beaches offer amazing views of wildlife. While some resent the fact that many Georgia islands are privately owned or protected by government, it can be argued that with different circumstances, Georgia's coast would be heavily developed with condos and cars. This kind of paradise exists because after the Civil War, a lot of people could not pay their property taxes and began to sell the land. The influx of northern money into the Georgia Islands is really the salvation of our coast because unlike other areas such as Florida or the Carolinas, uh, Georgia's coast is largely protected, privately owned, state owned, federally managed, and it began with the influx of northern money. The so-called captains of industry of the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, sometimes they get a bad rap, but at the same time, they were really Georgia's first conservationists, at least as far as the coastline is concerned, because without them and the evolution of the islands going from private to state or federal control in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, it, things might be completely different here in coastal Georgia. Waters that separate the islands from the mainland serve as buffers against storms and can be rich with crabs and fish. Boats docked along the Darien Harbor are among the top scenic spots along the way. Just a short distance from Darien is the dock to catch a ferry to Sapelo Island, where you cross Doughboy Sound and land on a place once home to tobacco heir R.J. Reynolds and still home to direct descendants of slaves purchased and brought here to work on plantations. They put it down, pick it up, dug it, close it up. <laughs> they did everything. Everything was literally done by the, the power of, of my ancestors back. They dug irrigation canals for rice and worked in the hot sun to harvest the crops. The Civil War ended the plantation era and former slaves bought property on which their descendants still live today. There's something about putting your feet in this dirt that makes you different whether you're black or white. And if you go out in the, in the river to fishing and you get that mud between your toes and whatsoever, you will never be the same. Some part of your soul is planted here and, and, and you can't run away from it no matter what. And even if you do move away for a while, you just can't. 
We have had people who have lived for over 50 years and better in other places. But one of the last requests, when I die, bring me back to Sapelo. And they bury here on Sapelo. And um, because that's where they want their remains to be. And because this is home. And this is home to us. I mean, what better place? There's the fresh air, there's the birds, there's the music of nature. There's everything you need here. What, why would you want to go where there's traffic and crime and silliness <laughs> when, you know, when you have everything you have here, you know? The state of Georgia owns and manages most of Sapelo. 50 miles south of Savannah, this is the fourth largest barrier island. Sapelo is hauntingly beautiful, with a lighthouse at the edge of the sea. Open beaches and glorious estuaries where rivers meet the ocean waters. Plantation ruins known as chocolate have been preserved on the edge of Mud River. It is a captivating place to watch the sun go down. Fifty miles south of Savannah is an island that has special inhabitants. St. Catharines is owned by a foundation. You can only come here by invitation. The ring-tailed lemurs roam freely and serve as an insurance policy since their natural habitat on the African island of Madagascar has lost much of its forest cover. They do well on this wildlife preserve that is dedicated to science and conservation. The island holds many secrets, like this church marked with pews and believed to be the oldest church in the country. Archaeologists uncovered more than 400 Wali Indians buried under this ground. St. Catharines was home to a large Spanish mission, and its significance is profound in the study of natural history. The uh, Mission Santa Catalina de Wali was really the, the crown jewel of the mission system in Spanish Florida. Uh, and when we say Florida here, we mean Georgia. Uh, th this, this is different than football. Uh, and these, these communities meshed in a brand new way with the Spanish that we haven't seen, we certainly had not seen it in the world before, and I'm not sure we've seen it since then. So what happened on St. Catharines in coastal Georgia you have the tribes fighting with each other to curry favor with the Spanish and cut a deal with the friars. I don't know of any place else in the world like that. And this went on for more than a century. The Indians giving the Spanish exactly what they needed and the Spanish giving the Indians back exactly what they needed. There were more 16th and 17th century religious items dug up on this island than from all the other Spanish missions of that period put together. St. Catharines and Georgia's other barrier islands are also special in another way. They're the product of two different changes in sea level. So there's an old chunk and a young chunk. And the old chunk that's 50,000 years old is a big deal because it's out there, it's the product of a former sea level change back in the Ice Age. Asabal is equally remarkable, with its rugged terrain and empty beaches. It is only about 20 miles south of Savannah. One of the largest barrier islands, it is teeming with wildlife. 
Freshwater ponds attract a wide variety of birds. Just like about every island in Georgia, alligators roam freely. They have a great life on Ossobal because there are few people to disturb them. They just move at a lazy pace, seemingly without a care in the world. Loggerhead turtles nest on Ossobal beaches every year, and weeks later, their babies hatch from eggs buried in the sand. Instinctively, they know to crawl forward to the sunrise and continue a cycle that has gone on for centuries. This is a state-designated heritage preserve that limits visitation. There are organized trips with the Osaba Island Foundation, but with little human disturbance, it may be one of the most quiet islands of all. There is evidence that Native Americans lived here more than 4,000 years ago. But the island's recent history began in 1924, when it was purchased by Michigan doctor Henry Torrey. He built a spectacular Spanish revival home that still stands today. Roger Parker worked for the family 60 years. They call him the Saltwater Cowboy. Well, when I first came here, I worked with the cattle and horses and oh, the hogs all the time. That's what I've done. We, I moved, uh, I think, probably 90-something head of donkeys off here. Whenever, 90. Yeah, whenever the state wanted to get all the donkeys off. And we kept eight donkeys here. The tame donkeys that you see around here, there's eight of those left. He also controlled the hogs, a special breed brought over in the 1500s by Spanish explorers. It is a dramatic island, and though it is close to Savannah, it can seem as if you're on another planet. I guarantee you it'd be hard for you to come here and say, well, I'm going to stay here. I just want to be on the island. Uh, I'll work and do anything you want me to. Well, you'll do it for about six weeks. And after six weeks is up, then you'll start looking across, go to that dock and start looking across on that mainland over there and see all them lights at night. And the next thing you'll be wanting, you won't be wanting to get over there to them lights. You know? Yeah. I've been down on that dock many a time wishing I was on the other side. Even so, there is such a vibrant ecosystem here that most visitors always come back. It is the rich human history coupled with the raw wildness that is captivating. You don't have to be a cowboy to love it. Where can you go and enjoy being on the island, enjoy going fishing, go and get oysters, go and get clam, catching all the crab you wanted. I mean, if you're a country boy and, and raised up like that, why wouldn't you love it? You will not be alone on Tybee Island so close to Savannah, it is often referred to as the city's beach. Here are the stereotypical oceanfront scenes, and it has existed for a very long time. Tybee has an interesting history because it's always been known as Savannah's Beach, 
And the, the, the resort aspect of, of Tybee goes back to the late 1880s, early 1890s, when they actually built a railroad from Savannah out to Tybee Island, and that enabled the people of Chatham County and the Savannah area to get to Tybee to enjoy the, the beach. And it kind of grew into this little beach resort community without being too fancy. It's never been a fancy place. It's uh, been always sort of like, you go to Tybee now and it has that 1950s feel to it in some parts of it. But the backside of Tybee, along Little Tybee Island, is a different place. Canals break through grass, and a stop at any point can bring you face to face with nature. Dragonflies battle. Butterflies dart. And if you're lucky, you can see how a skinny-necked bird manages to swallow a nice, fat fish. This is the Tybee locals know. It is sweet, quiet, and full of life. All the Georgia islands possess a sense of calm and inspire a feeling that follows you home. Each island has its own personality, and collectively they combine to create one of the richest shorelines in the nation. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time. Funding for Georgia Outdoors has been made possible by grants from the Georgia Natural Resources Foundation, the Emlay Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, and from viewers like you.